I've seen, I've seen some, uh, I've seen some trees from the UK here in the last couple days that I've been in England, and <clears throat> I'm surprised. How come you guys don't put more trees into the Nolanders Trophy? <coughs> Anybody have any feedback? Why not more? Too modest. Too modest. I think a lot of us think our our tree is good enough yet when you see some of some of the really good European material. Ah. Uh, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but we're getting there. You are getting there. Yeah. You are getting there. England's making a comeback. Don't call it a comeback. It's like the Italians, the UBI shows that when they start doing the books, you see the rawness of them when they first started doing the books, and then they see how it's developing through the years. And then they get that stage where they start bringing a lot of Japanese trees in, and they'll stop using the European trees. Whether they use stop them to wait in the big European trees at, of high quality before they show them, or, or what, I don't know. Because you hear all the rumours, well, somebody's got this and somebody's got that, and, but you haven't seen them yet. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. What do you guys think about Japanese trees compared to European trees now? What's your impression? <coughs> I've got my opinion. What's your impression? I think we need to develop... No, I'm not, I would not a Japanese tree, but we need to develop what we have in, in our country. Uh, I agree. Yeah. <coughs> there was something that happened. I don't know where that transition occurred. <coughs> I came back to the United States. Well, I came back. I went back to the United States. And... Uh, I started working on American material, and at first, because I was so accustomed to working on Japanese trees, it was, it was hard, right? Different characteristics, different aesthetic. People are saying, we want, we want trees to look like American trees, and it's like, well, what do American trees look like? And maybe you guys are searching for what do English trees look like? I don't know. Or maybe you found it, and you're just developing that now. But as I continue to work on American material, what I realize is that there's a soul to collected trees and there's a soul to using native material that you can't get in a Japanese tree. Because you're not Japanese. And, I, and I'm not Japanese and I studied in Japan for six years and I'm still not Japanese. And most of the Japanese stuff that we actually get in has been... To do what we want to do has been done. Right. You can't do a lot with it. Right. Because it's totally raw. I mean, Japanese only let go of Japan what Japan wants to go. <laughs> and best stuff doesn't come out of Japan. <laughs> Depends how big your wallet is. 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 Depends how big your Am I not cold? No. No. But what do you guys think about this? Are you guys as excited about this as I am? This is going to be killer. <laughs> because now when this branch gets dropped down into here, and this branch gets dropped down into here, the width of this whole thing is only going to be this wide. Now we've closed that down significantly. And we've raised this up, so now the focal point is going to be right in here. And ideally what we wanted was the apex right here. Yeah, well, we're not gluttons, right? We want this tree to survive, too. If it doesn't survive, it works pointless, okay? And you're in trouble. And I'm in trouble. I don't get to come back to Willowbog. <laughs> Do you think any of the dead wood's going to be in your road on the top, Brian? Any of this? Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. What do you guys think? What do you guys feel about this dead wood, good or bad? You want to improve it? Seems a bit thick unless you bring more finesse into it. What's the characteristic of you, Deadwood? Let me ask you that. What what makes you, Deadwood, look like you, Deadwood? Grain. Grain. Hollows. 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 There you go. Yeah. Hollow Deadwood. Depth right? in the in the Deadwood. So this actually is quite young. Yeah. It looks quite young. Yeah. A really old you would have rotted out hollow Deadwood. Yeah. Okay. Here's the problem. You guys are only here for a day, yeah. and uh, I only have less than a day to do this. So maybe this tree is going to be a work in progress for the next time I come to Willowbog. 
right? That, that's my single utmost motivation in what I do. So teaching people to do that, pursue bonsai at that level, appreciate bonsai at that level, hopefully buy bonsai of that quality, right? That would help me out. But more than that, having that kind of bonsai culture created where that level of bonsai is desired and appreciated. That's, that's, that's what we're after. So starting the show, a show run by people with an expectation of the highest quality bonsai we could possibly produce in North America was where the thought of the artisans got started. Right? So you guys have just told me that you don't have a show in the UK right? that gives you that opportunity. What are you going to do about that? Anything. No. <laughs> I'm just asking. There's a problem getting people together, I think that's the problem <laughs> in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very often if somebody just tried to do something, I so think somebody happen. else is trying to kick them down all the time. Yeah, right. Peter Warren will end up being inspired by the artisans company. Yeah. I can say I can do that. And Peter's going to start doing something. Home enthusiasts. You want to know something? Yeah. Peter Warren inspired the artisans cup. Excellent. So why did he give it to you first, though? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the compliment. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
okay? And that's what gives me that compressive nature. So here now it's quite loose, right? And I'm maintaining some tension on it by just making sure that this doesn't slip, but when I get it where I want it, then I apply the compression. So applying raffia, one of the things that I, that, I, that I notice people do is they try to keep it super tight the entire time. And that's virtually impossible to have good raffia if you do that, yeah? have any other questions for me? Any questions about Japan or the United States or Europe or Millanders or Ginkgo or... Ryan Knight. Use. Randy Knight. Knight. Randy, sorry, Randy Knight. Uh-huh. Um, do you get out clapping with him, Ryan, do you? <laughs> Randy Knight would leave me dead on the mountain. Really? <laughs> Randy Knight is... Uh, Randy Knight is a, is a unique individual. That there's, there's probably not another one like him. Yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, you guys know who Randy Knight is? You ever heard this name before? He's not a porn star. <laughs> <laughs> you say he's not a porn star. Right? <laughs> Just, you know, for many, for many, for many uh, rich people would be, this is going to be on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows who said it. Made it worse, I So Randy Knight, uh, Randy Knight is a young Dory collector. He collects, uh, pines and junipers across the western United States, and he's probably, and I've said this before amidst a whirlwind of controversy, right, and I'll say it again because it's true, he's probably the best collector in the world right now. He, he collects seven to eight hundred trees a year, uh, and he has a high, uh, well he has a mid to low 90% success rate, okay, so virtually, he virtually doesn't lose trees, because he's very, very cognizant about what he does. Uh, but, but more than that, if you see the quality of trees he collects, it's beyond anything that anybody's collecting in the Western world that I've seen outside of some very uh, unique situations in, in Spain and Italy, right? Just fantastic material of the utmost quality. Probably fantastic enough that it's, it, it's actually over the head of most North Americans to be used on. But we're closing the gap, right? Technique allows us to be able to use this material, and, and Randy's material is... is, is Highly, highly in demand right now. So, what's that? Highly expensive. Not compared to Europe. Not compared to Europe. No oh, way. So the pines you collect, uh, what well, he's collecting, are these, are these good as Scots pine or? Different, different characteristic completely. Different. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. The feel of, of the ponderosa pine is, is completely North American. Yeah. You know, and, and anybody that, that's gone across the Western United States knows ponderosa pine and has a fondness for ponderosa pine. Do they have large needles? Large needles, but they're reducible if you understand the theories behind pines. Yeah, do they come down much? What's that? Do they come down much? They come down a lot. Yeah? Yeah, but you got to cultivate them correctly. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like your Scots pine, but your Scots pine and Yugo pine are more forgiving. Yeah. Much, much, much more forgiving. Yeah. So it's a slow process, really? No, it's quick if you do it right. All oh, right. Everything's quick. Yeah. Do it right. If you have the best technique, <laughs> bonsai happens very, very fast. Yeah. Extremely fast. <clears throat> oh, sweetness. I'm sorry this is taking time, guys. I've got all these little branches to go around. Is mostly your focus on uh, Native American trees? Yeah, 90% of my garden is native North American trees. Yeah, absolutely. Because, here's the thing, when you've got, it's like I was saying about Japanese trees, when you've got trees that, that really express a mentality that you understand, the capacity to create something special with those increases exponentially, right? So I don't know if you guys saw the Bonsai Focus article that I did um, last year on the juniper that was imported from Japan. It was a uh, a big uh, Chinensis? No? Probably not? Okay. Anyways, I had, I had styled a Rocky Mountain Juniper prior to coming to the Nolander Trophy last year. And, uh, and then on stage, Mark had given me two really big Nugo Pines over two demonstrations to do. And then I went to Bonsai Focus Studios and then I, and I styled this Japanese tree. Uh, that was a very, uh, not a famous, but it was a nice, very nice Japanese Juniper. And, and it was interesting to me to go from, from sort of the, the pinnacle of North American 
quality material to a, a very, very high level of, of European material to a, an extremely high level of Japanese material in, in essentially four days, right? Four days, four different cultures, four different material, or three different pieces, three different types of material originating from these cultures. And the, the necessity to address these pieces of material with a different mentality struck me in a way I've never been, I've never, I've never realized how much culture dictates your approach to bonsai before. So, <clears throat> I talked about all this with Farron as we did the photo shoot and he didn't write about any of it. Um, <laughs> which I was disappointed about. <laughs> but he said it's going to come out in a later article, we'll see if that happens. Anyways, um, it's, it's very interesting to me how, how much culture dictates the way we approach bonsai. And you see it, you see it in Japanese in terms of the tradition and the, um, and the longevity of their techniques and the, at times, sedentary nature that they approach bonsai, but also the tradition with which they approach it. Uh, and you see it in Europe with the flamboyant art artistry that you guys approach bonsai and the pots and the potters and the things that you guys use and the things that you guys do and even even the accents and dead woods and, and sand and things that you don't typically see as accent companion pieces in a bonsai display. In Europe you do. It's very interesting. And in North America we're still searching for that. So then I would ask you, if you guys think about North America, right? Because we're in the UK now, but I just want to know your guys' impression because this is a unique opportunity for me. If you think about North America, and you don't have to be polite either, what's one word that describes North American culture? Fat. <laughs> PH. PH, yeah, right. right. Fat, okay, all right, good. I'm glad we got that out of the way. What's another one? Loud. What's that? Loud. Loud, okay, loud. What else? Confident. Confident. Brush. Interesting. What'd you say? Brush. Brush. Boy. You guys don't think very highly of those <laughs> <laughs> So I was kind of thinking freedom. The opposite, actually. I think they love that. Once they come away from the States. Like once they're over here, they like to know, you know, I'm a foreigner. Oh, yeah. They don't nice people over here travel as well. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Don't you know? But they're okay in America. <laughs> Maybe not, I don't know. Anyways, that's interesting. I'm happy to know all that. Gives me a new perspective on being an American. <laughs> uh, I, th I think really when you look at you look at Europe and you see history and artistry and uh, also craft, you know, the, the concept of apprenticeship is not foreign to Europeans. Right? That's a very fundamental aspect of your culture. Okay? We were talking about building stone walls, right? And I was reading a book about a stone wall builder. I love building stone walls. My whole garden is stone walls, right? I, I, I don't know how to build stone walls, but I do anyways, okay? And, and uh, we're talking about learning to build stone walls and how there aren't many people that can do it anymore in the UK or do it well. And you talk about this concept of studying and apprenticeship and whatnot. That, that's, not a, that's not a foreign thought to you guys, but in the United States it is, right? When you go to Japan, you see this culture and you see this history you also see, see this artistry, but attention to detail, right? Attention to detail and tradition govern Japanese mentality, and particularly how they approach bonsai, right? This history of these trees, this longevity, right? And we don't, we don't deviate from the plan. But when you go to the United States, we don't really have artistry, and we don't really have longevity, and we, and we definitely don't have um, really any longstanding culture. So then what do we have, right? And, and I think we have that whole, that, ver that very, very unique concept of you're not going to tell me what to do, total freedom. And so that's all any American really wants, right? Freedom. Just total, just leave me alone. I'm, I'm free, right? So how does that apply to bonsai? That's been the, that's been my recent thought process. Everybody wants to make something that nobody's ever seen before, right? Ryan, there's too many rules between cold trees and the same. Mm. That's an interesting question. Who asked that? Okay. In Japan, are there too many rules? Are all the trees going to look the same? So let me ask you something. Have you ever been to Japan? No. No. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating to see what I thought of Japan before I went and then what I think of Japan now, having gone, right? <laughs> what you realize, if you've never been to, J or never been to Japan and you go, is that there aren't any rules, right? 
There are no rules, really. You see bonsai that are as free form, avant garde, uh, artistic, um, and displayed in manners that we <coughs> think, typically think of deviating from Japanese rules as you do bonsai that conform to those rules. And, and so if you go to Japan, you realize, huh, so we've been talking about this concept of cookie cutter, cookie cutter, bonsai, or this concept of trees that follow all of these regulations. And we, that's our impression of Japanese bonsai, and really it doesn't exist, right? And quite the contrary, if you wanted to learn how to create naturalistic bonsai, you could go to Japan and you could find several examples of that, right? Or artistic bonsai, you could find sample, several examples of that. So no, I don't think that all their trees will ever look the same, and in fact, I think they're getting different, more different now than they've ever been. What do you think, Peter? Uh, I think, yeah, exactly. Um, the, there was a lot more commercial uh, influence on the way a lot of the trees are styled. Uh, particularly if you want to get a tree into the, the Concord, the National Exhibition, there is a certain aesthetic that you need to fit into. Uh, and so that has driven uh, a lot of uh, creation of trees, uh, styling of trees over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Now the pressure is, is off uh, there quite, uh, as, as much as it used to be. And so a lot of people now are uh, are getting a bit freer. Uh, yeah. And there's also um, the biggest market now for, for the Japanese, really, is the Chinese. The Chinese have been buying a lot of, uh, a lot of trees, and they, they, they hate very compact, uh, very uh, boring trees, which uh, a lot of people will claim that the, the, the Kokofu trees can be a lot, a lot like that. And so the, the, the Chinese influence <coughs> on Japan is going to be seen, I think, over the next five to ten years, people are starting to make trees that are a lot more free, a lot less compact. You know, it's interesting though, when you talk about how what's established this baseline of, of bonsai quality and culture in Japan, there's always this reference to the Kokufu, the Kokufu, the Kokufu, the Kokufu, the Kokufu exhibition. The Kokufu exhibition basically outlined what quality bonsai was, right? And it also gave a motivation for the Japanese bonsai community to strive for and improve, right? And you see the ginkgo in, the, in Europe. And, you know, I don't know what the ginkgo, what you guys think of the ginkgo being Europeans and having been present for that. Um, I, don't, I don't know what your impression of that whole thing is, but for me, being in North America, watching that go down, the ginkgo awards changed European bonsai forever, right? Forever. It changed you guys. And, and when the ginkgos went away, it changed you guys again, right? Because you had that and then you didn't. And so what happens when you have it and when you don't, you realize how much you miss it, and now you've got the Nolanders trophy that's kind of picking up the slack, it seems like. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah? It's taking over now, yeah. But it's giving you guys something to strive for, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So one of the other things that, that we've been dealing with in North America is, okay, so, so there needs to be a, a goal and an objective, but people in North America, they don't want their trees to be judged. Mm -hmm. right, they don't want their trees, they, they don't believe in competition, they think bonsai should be a friendly endeavor. Right? But if you don't have some level of expectation to rise to, how are you supposed to improve? Yeah. And this is just a, a sort of a stream of conscious thought that right? I continually think about as I pursue bonsai because, you know, what, what, is, what is my motivation? I mean, I was on the road nine months cumulatively last year, that means I was in my garden three months. It means I didn't have a life, right? This is bonsai or bonsai. And that got to be really, really tiring. But was there a reason for that? Was there an objective behind it? And trying to get North American bonsai to improve. And then you start saying, well, if it's going to improve, it needs a ginkgo or it needs a coke food. So now we have an artisan's cup. Right? But maybe English bonsai needs a ginkgo or a coke food. Well, we've got no one. <coughs> you got no one. It's easier, it's easier for some people to get the no one. It, <laughs> it actually is. Yeah. If you're in the south of England, it's easier to get there than it is to, to come all the way up here. No kidding. So, you know. So the people that are here today, it was tough to get here. <coughs> For some people. For yeah. some people, yes. Wow. So people have come some distance. And it's very easy to get your trees to the trophy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can get them where they need to get them. You missed out there, Mark. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you read my mind, though. Slack. 
You guys think more? Yeah. More? More. Slack, can you? One more, huh? So let me ask you something. If we go more here, we have this here. Do we need this? Nope. Do we need that? No. Nope. You do. <coughs> Let's go a little bit more. If this breaks, it's your fault now. nothing more dangerous than when you bend a heavy branch and it doesn't break. And there's nothing more defeating than when you bend it and it snaps in half. Shatters your confidence. <laughs> What's that? This one just needs what? No, this one yeah. just needs what? Just trim it. Just trim it. Yeah. Shorten it up a little bit. Okay. So one of the things. I might we, be wrong. No, no, no. You could be right. I think that you could be right. Okay. So one of the things we've also got to be cognizant of is the fact that we've got this length in here, this distance that we don't want to show. So if we take a picture of this and you can see this expanse of this branch on the interior, it's going to defeat the purpose of what we've done. We're trying to close the gap, right? And then we would be opening the gap up. This is one of those gray areas, right? How does this branch interact with the rest of the tree? You guys be thinking about it, because when we get to it, it's going to be your choice, not mine. So I have a, I have a, a apprentice from France now. That's uh, studying with me. He's been with me for nine months, and he'll be there for another two years. <coughs> and I'm, he's starting to get to wire some of the more major trees in the garden. But it's always interesting. I remember Mr. Kimura used to go to auction, and he would bring home these really horrific trees. Really, really crummy trees. And I mean super crummy. Like, why would you buy this tree? Crummy. But then he would give it to me. And he would say, here you go. Style that. And he would always tell me, this is the most expensive tree that I bought at auction. <laughs> and I knew that wasn't true, because it was crap. But he always told me that. And he would say, so now you have to make it a more valuable tree. And of course, you're sitting there. Here's Mr. Mr. Kimura has given me the opportunity. An untouched piece of material. Style this. Style this. Make this a beautiful bonsai. And what would happen is I would start thinking. And I would think, and I would think, and I would think. And I would think so long, and I would think so hard, I forgot what I was actually thinking. Right? I had no idea what was right or wrong. I was thinking, he wants this. I kind of like this. I could do this. Oh my gosh, what's happening here? And he would be sitting in the workshop as I'd be doing this. I always hoped he would leave, and he would never leave whenever he gave me a tree to style. So he would be sitting there, and he would be pruning a tree, and he would be looking at me while he's still cutting. Right? He's not even looking at what he's cutting. He's looking at me. And I'm thinking, this is not a comfortable situation at all, whatsoever. And inevitably, I would style a tree that was horrible. Right? Horrible. And I would hand it to him, and he would look at it, and he would look at me, and he would shake his head as if to say, this is what you've accomplished. Are you serious? This is what you've come here for. 
So in the end, by maybe the fourth or fifth tree that he had given me to style, I finally realized, you know, the only thing that I can do is do exactly what I think needs to happen because I can't hardly live with myself when I sit here and do what he thinks needs to be done. I can't. I just can't live with myself. So I started just trusting my own gut instinct and styling trees, and all of a sudden he wasn't looking at me with disappointment anymore. It was an interesting, interesting point of learning for me. Oh. Crazy. So anyways, watching my French apprentice go, go through the same thing has some level of masochistic satisfaction. <laughs> okay. I'm still learning what it, what all of the all of the little nuances of what Mr. Camaro was trying to teach me. Every day I realize, ha, ah, that's what that was all about. Having an apprentice has changed me. But at the end of the day, you can get four different people at your your level of bonsai. And you have the same tree, you have four different trees at the end of the day. Oh, absolutely, right? It's, everybody's going to be attracted to different nuances in a tree. You bet. Well, in two. And I think having that is to have the eye to decide where you've got to start. That's what beats a lot of us, not well, not so the long ones. Yeah. Well, I think, too, you've got to understand, or the person creating has to understand why it is they're doing what they're doing. You know? So in the United States, one of the big questions right now is, how do we know that an instructor is good? Because you've got all these instructors coming back from Japan now, and they're, and they're you know, there's Mike Hagedorn, there's Peter T, and there's myself, there's going to be Matt Reel, Kathy Shaner, and Boone, and all of these people. And people are, they're, they're, they're coming back and they're saying, well, we can, you know, we can style these trees like this instead. And people said, well, I style this with my instructor. And I thought that they were good. And, 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 and what, what happened? How do we know that somebody's good or somebody's not, you know? And I think one of the telltale signs that somebody is good is if they can tell you why they made the decisions they're making, right? So why are we bringing the foliage closer? Why are we changing the lines in this tree? Why did we separate this from the living vein and the dead wood? Why did we do all these things? All of a sudden, if you know why, now you're educated enough to start doing some of it yourself, for one. And two, you can have confidence that you're getting a proficient instructor. If I were you went with the commuter line, did you, did you have an American instructor or not? Yeah, you bet. You bet. I, I, yeah, I, I, so the first person to ever give me any time uh, and, and, and really really start to, to dedicate some attention to me, his name was Harold Sasaki. Yeah. And Harold Sasaki uh, is a man, gentleman from Colorado. He's actually one of the pioneers of, of Yamadori collecting in the United States. So I, I lived uh, three hours from Denver, which was the nearest city. And uh, I got to go there maybe twice a year to do school shopping, right? So I always look forward to going to Denver. And when I got into Bonsai, uh, I looked up in the phone book and I saw Harold's place. And so I went to Harold's place and I saw all of these fantastic ponderosa pines. Because he'd been collecting ponderosa pines for a long time. And I thought, oh my gosh, I had no idea this was this could be bonsai. And at that same time, I was looking at bonsai Europe. Right? And there was an article from Terry Foster on a Scots pine, twin trunk Scots pine, I'll never forget it. And, I, and his transformation of that Scots pine... Uh, had a significant impact on me. I've never met Terry Foster. To this day, I would still like to meet Terry Foster like Terry and, and Terry. tell him thank you. You yeah, know, because it was like it was just it really had an impression <coughs> on me. Um, but anyways, so Harold Harold, I used to once I once I started working with Harold, I used to drive over after school. I was in high school. I'd drive over after school. It was a three-hour drive. I'd leave school at about four o'clock in the afternoon. I'd get to his house at seven. We'd work till nine. He'd stay open. We'd work till nine, and then I'd drive home get home about midnight and go to school the next day. And we started doing that once a month. Uh, and he told me that I should go to college in California and look up Ben Oki. Right? And so I went to school in California, uh, San Luis Obispo, which is right in between San Francisco and the Bay Area. And I looked up Ben Oki, and he also told me to look up Ted Madsen. And I looked up Ben Oki and Ted Madsen, and both of those people have been humongously influential uh, in my bone type career. Of course, Ted was the, the, the person that I studied most with. In college, and then Ben Oki was the was the gentleman who took me to Japan and introduced me to Mr. Kimura. He was the first apprentice to John Naka. So, uh, both of them extremely influential in my bonsai life. Um, but you know, one of the one of the overriding things that I realized as I was traveling around uh, weekends trying to finish my schoolwork while I'm sleeping in the back of my truck studying bonsai was uh, there's a lot of things that I'm not going to learn unless I go to Japan. 
And so there, there was no choice. It never was a choice. It was just what we did. I just went to Japan. There were things that people needed to know. I needed to know. If a bonsai was going to improve in the United States, everyone needed to know. Yeah. And uh, we went and got those. And we saw that early on. And then saw that early on. Yeah. I knew that had to happen. Yeah. Yep. Do you see much difference in, in the uh, in bonsai between the states? You know, the, the sort of the northern states, and then you get out the southern states. Right? Absolutely. The yeah. Cyprus and all those. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Florida has its own culture completely. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I went yeah. to Florida, I've got a chance to go to Jim Smith's nursery in Florida. Yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah, and you got the Buttonwoods yeah. down from the Florida Keys, and you've oh. got the bald cypress, and you've got... Puerto Galaria. Yeah, Galaria. you've got the stuff imported from Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico is a, is a you know, a U.S. Um, yeah. colony yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so you've got all of this material that <laughs> it doesn't exist anywhere else, yeah. and, and, and they handle it, you know, I think they're learning to handle it better and better. Yeah. But then you go up to New York and you're talking about all deciduous material, right? There's no conifers really. There are a few, but not many conifers east of the Rocky Mountains that are re really prominently used in bonsai. So you've got a deciduous, heavy deciduous influence. You go down to, to um, Tennessee, South Carolina, Alabama, you've got a totally different look. You go up to the Pacific Northwest now different look, and then California is the big one, yeah, right? Yeah. And not only California, but North and South. Northern California, the Bay Area, has their own, they use Sierra junipers out of the mountains. Southern California use California junipers, and they both stick to what they use very well. They love it, they support it, they stand by it, and it creates this real interesting tension and culture that exists only there. Where's Peter? Are we, is it about lunchtime? Do we need to break real quick? going to kick on and once we get past the, the war cry then all of a sudden the heat comes and we're all going to start dozing off. Uh, <clears throat> all right so we made uh, significant progress in the structure. Okay so structure is always the first thing that we set and take care of whenever we style a tree. It's, it's the most important fundamental thing that we do. A good structure means a good tree to be built. A bad structure means a tree that could look good but will never continue to develop. Right. So structure is 90% of the work. We said that earlier, the other 10%, Mr. Kamari used to say a monkey can do, right? That was always offensive as an apprentice, but it's true, right? So when we start learning about styling branches, once the structure is set, the big moves have been made, the branches are in the right place, all, is it, all, all that it comes down to is being able to fundamentally lay out a path, a branch path, okay? Now the interesting thing about fundamentally laying out a branch path is it sounds simple, right? Fundamental means simple, right? It means basic, but... <clears throat> Whenever you look at the structure of a tree, there's a lot of things that we miss when we analyze that structure, okay? So I'm going to ask you guys, and people that were in the workshop, you guys cannot respond to this. Where is the only place you can create a clean line in a bonsai? The only place you can create a clean line in a bonsai. Heard the trunk, but you're, you're creating it. You actually have to make this. Bottom of pods. What's that? Underneath the pads? Very good. Okay? So when you look at a really highly defined tree, see you cheated, you weren't supposed to say anything. <laughs> you cheated. No workshop participants. No workshop participants. <laughs> right? Okay? When you look at a tree, a highly defined tree, and you see this, this definition, does it occur on the top of the pad or the bottom? Right? It's always the bottom, right? It's that clean line. So when you look at a pad, this clean line on the bottom is what gives you definition in between foliage spaces. So when you separate pads, it's this clean line on the bottom that gives you the separation because this upper area is informal. 
That's what makes it look natural. If the upper area were a clean, hedge-shaped line, it would look like a topiary, not a bonsai, right? So that bottom line. So when we talk about fundamental branch structure, right, it really comes down to the palm of your hand. Flat, right? We want this bottom to be flat. We want these to be evenly spread. Even distribution of foliage, right? And here's another kicker. This is a biggie, right? The angles in between all of the branches should be very acute. Acute, okay? So very rarely do you see a tree that grows like this, where the, where the main branch is growing or the trunk is growing, and the branch grows off at an obtuse angle and back towards the trunk or back towards the branch. That almost never happens. Now, as we talked about in the workshop, you could go find that in nature, take a picture, bring it back, and say, ha, 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 I found it, right? That's not the fundamental way that branches grow. The main stem grows, a new bud emerges, the new bud germinates and starts to move alongside the main stem and then out towards light. That's what gives us that acute angle, okay? So when you start talking about the formation of branch pads, okay, that's how a pad is formed. That's how you build a branch, right? If you want to break it down to even simpler forms, when we're dealing with a tree like this, at every junction we can only have two branches. Okay? So that comes down to here. Okay? That's how a branch is formed. Right? If we have more than two branches at any one of these junctions, we start getting three. We start to have an uneven distribution of foliage. We know at this joint where we have three branches occurring, we have a swelling that causes a structural problem, and lo and behold, we've now defeated the purpose or started to detriment the structure of the tree. Okay? We all on the same page? All good? Okay. So as I'm sitting up here styling and Peter's going to help me wire this tree, now that we've got the structure relatively laid out and I've got one more major branch to position and, and take care of, but the, the general structure is done. We're going to be fundamentally organizing and structuring these pads. This may be horribly boring. We're going to try to tell stories and talk to you guys and give you information to keep you educated while we're doing it. But one of the major things to take from this that I'm going to give you, this is your homework assignment as you watch this. You see this structure. It looks like an octopus now, right? This looks totally disarranged and you're saying, I drove all the way to Willowbog to watch some guy that we heard studied with Mr. Kimura and makes good bonsai and this is what I've got, right? But watch how this comes together as a bonsai now, because this is how I used to have trees passed to me when I was an apprentice. This is exactly what I would give my apprentice now, and I would say, okay, make this look like a beautiful bonsai, right? This structure, 90% of the work being done, now you get the last 10%. The last 10% is really the last 10% that matters, right? It's what makes it look beautiful. 90% of it makes it look like this. Well, finish work, the last 10%. Okay, so pay attention to that as we're working, and if you guys have questions, <coughs> we're all ears. I could start to lose my voice here pretty soon, but we'll see if we can't hold out. I got sick when I came to England. <laughs> <coughs> you guys have any questions before we really get rolling? Nothing? So I'm still not losing hope that we might try just a little bit more. I'm gonna keep this. I'm gonna keep this wire for the jack in here, just in case we feel adventurous. You guys think we can take it a little bit farther? Yeah, yeah go for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it hasn't cracked for at least half an hour. <laughs> so, if it were your tree, would you bend it farther? I would. Yeah. We do have it. What's up, Peter? Walk with, away. With my help, so so you Walk can blame it on me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, well, that's what would happen. <laughs> like you made me. <laughs> you bend that side. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I always give. I always give students a choice. You want to bend or tighten, and most of them will say, "I'll tighten." Yeah. <laughs> but if there's a situation where I think it's really gonna break, then I'll say, "You got. You bend, and I'll tighten." Yeah. <laughs> See how that works. I saw that. You saw how that worked, yeah. huh? What's that? <laughs> The leading question as well. Do you think it'll go a bit further? <laughs> yeah. I think I think that it wants to go further. Yeah. That's right. I think that it wants to go further. I don't know if he wants it to go further. He does. He wants the best possible finished bonsai. He wants the best possible live bonsai too. <laughs> <laughs>
And so I think one of the comments that I heard as I was standing up here is, there was 500 pounds on the ground right there. Was that what we decided? Yeah. <coughs> More than that, right. That's the last thing he wants to hear. <laughs> it's okay, you don't do the page yet. Uh, <laughs> see how that works, being a bonsai professional is an unfriendly business. <laughs> It's all the rage. Yeah. yeah we go with that. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> in all in all my travels, in all my travels, there have been there have been two days where I've given the people discounts. I've said I just <clears throat> I didn't come with a, a mentality to do bone site today and, and you didn't get your money's worth and I I don't feel comfortable. Uh, receiving full pay. N neither of those two days happened here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so work. Don't get your hopes up. It's one day left. Yeah, well, you know, I'm going I'm to show up tomorrow, don't worry. For everybody that's coming tomorrow, I'll be here. Uh, and, then, and, and, and then, besides that, there's been one, one poor unfortunate soul who just through the, you know, sheer unfortunate events that unfolded, uh, every single tree we touched at his house broke. Every single one of them. Four trees we bent that day. Four trees that broke. I've never broke a client's tree in my life until that day. And every one of them broke. Was that looking friends? <laughs> what do you say to somebody when you do that? Did you, did you not like him? So, has he had the boxes, right? Huh? Has he had the boxes? We don't talk anymore. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Uh, happens, right? I always used to ask Mr. Kimura, what do you do when you break, break a tree on stage? And he said, well, you use it as an opportunity to teach them how to patch it. <laughs> and I thought that that was a great way to look at it, but <clears throat> I watched trees break with him on stage, and he didn't use it as an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> he just kept going. <clears throat> so there was, a, there was a request while we were having lunch uh, to discuss some of the, the training habits of, of Cuspidata. Does everybody here have a you, or do a lot of us have these uh, taxes cuspidata? No. Okay, so the, the, the cuspidata is, is slightly more fussy than the, the European you, right? Are we all aware of that? They have a little bit more sensitive root system. They tend to, to sort of shun you if you handle their foliage wrong. So it's important to have a really good, clear idea of how cuspidata need to be trained in order to get the best out of them, right? The question was, how do you, how do you develop foliage, one, Best, best training plan and, and method of techniques and timing for uh, development of foliage mass. And then also, what was, what was the other one, Russ? After you to refine it more, ah. just sort of the maintenance pruning. Okay, so maintenance pruning after refinement. So, when we start talking about cuspidata, it's important to understand there's two times a year that they really respond well to being pruned, okay? We're talking about after they've pushed out their new flush, so they, whenever you think about trees, and this goes for deciduous trees, I'm just going to keep working so that I don't keep wasting time. We're going to talk about deciduous trees, and then also, e even when we start talking about pines and the way pines respond and how we handle them, okay? Trees in the spring, they push all of this energy, all of the stored energy that they had, that they allocated and, and, and stuck into places that could help them overwinter themselves. They've got all of this energy that they throw forward in the spring to produce this new growth, right? New season, new growth, let's go, rare and new grow. Okay? If we prune at the wrong time of year when they've pushed out this new growth and they haven't reaccumulated that energy, we're going to fail. We're going to fail. And a U is a perfect example of that. So, when you start talking about pruning time for U's, in Japan, the number one time to prune U's, we'll talk about second. The number two time is in late May. Right? Late May. So they pushed out their spring growth, their spring growth is hardened off, 
it's had time to reaccumulate energy, and then you go in and cut them back, and they've got that new flush of energy from all of that highly photosynthetic surface area that they pushed out in the spring that's hardened off, that's reaccumulated, and they give you a second flush of buds, right? So the number one time is in late fall, right? Which is really contrary to common horticultural thought. Why would you prune something in late fall and let it go through winter void of significant amounts of foliage? Okay, that's, that's uncomfortable. And in different winter climates, they probably respond differently. So I would never say in the UK, let's prune your use heavily in late November, right? But that's when we used to do it in Japan and get the best results. So is there something to be toyed with there? Absolutely, right? <coughs> if you take that same technique and you apply it to a redwood, right, a redwood from North America, it works to perfection if you, apply, if you prune them in late November, but you can't let them freeze, okay? So maybe there's something to be had for use there in, in, uh, in the UK in terms of how they'll respond with back budding and a profusion of, of good, solid, strong buds if you prune them in late fall. But then you've probably got to protect them a little bit. Okay? So if we're trying to push a tree back, reduce a tree, or get interior budding, late May, late fall, don't let them freeze. Okay? Perfect time to do that kind of work. Okay? Now, if we're talking about refinement, once we get that interior budding and growth, we go through and follow our fundamental concepts for branch structure, okay? Twos, because yous will put three, four, five buds in one location very happily, right? Take it down to two, the two strongest, the two best, the two that will become a branch. We keep our acute angles, we wire these out beautiful and flat. Okay, we know next year that the new buds are going to start growing vertically as well as out of, out of the tips, correct? Okay? So in Japan, in the springtime, there are several species that we're always pinching. Spruce? Zoisha white pine, yew, hemlock, right? We have to pinch these continuously, and needle juniper, but we talked about how we don't like to pinch needle juniper, okay? Or the workshop did. Anyways, when we pinch yew, you push out these, this flush of new growth, okay? When, we, when it's still soft, we pinch that, leaving always just a little bit, okay? If we take the whole thing off, then that bud is now gone, that tip is now dead, okay? Leaving always a little bit of new growth. What that does, right, it eliminates that, that suppression, of the hormone that exists in that apical bud. Okay, so if we talk about beech, it has a similar thing, right? You leave the strongest bud on the tip of a beech, that's the only bud that elongates when they open up in the spring, right? But you take that apical bud off and all of a sudden you get elongation of several branches down behind that. Have you guys had that experience? You know about this? Okay, it's the same with the U. If you don't pinch that, you just let that run, all of these buds that exist down this branch won't open, right? Because they're being held back by hormonal suppression. Suppression, oxen, okay? There's an oxen in the tip that says, I want to be the long, strong branch. You guys can't grow. You take that off, and all of a sudden, they're saying, yeah, we can all grow, okay? You pinch those, leaving a little bit. Now, these get to grow. Now, they're going to try to take over. That's how apical dominance occurs, and we get big, long, tall trees, right? The next bud in line takes over and says, I'm going to hold you guys back, okay? So we pinch those, boom, okay? And now that allows the third flush of buds to grow. So if you want development of foliage, once you get back budding, you've got to pinch. Because if you continue to let it grow and cut, let it grow and cut, let it grow and cut, you get tons of buds. But how many buds do you really need? You want foliage. You want development. You want pads. Okay, so to talk about developing, turning those buds into foliage, you've got to pinch. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> Pruning versus pinching. So it comes down to basically development versus refinement. Peter, you ready? <laughs> As you'll ever be. Now we call for the monkey. Nice. <laughs> the donkey. Just keep it fairly flat and simple.